Hi everybody, it's Steve Halley here with the Family Peace Initiative and welcome to the June 2023 Facilitator's Law. Uh, try to put one of these out each month, just helping all of us to pursue mastery of our craft. Uh, I'm assuming that none of us will ever achieve the status of masters of battering intervention facilitation, but the pursuit of mastery is critical. We are all in needing to become as good as we can be in this work because there's too many people that maybe we don't even meet who are dependent on us to be highly skilled at our craft. You know, victims of domestic violence, the family members of domestic violence, members of our community, they're all counting on us to have a high level of skill. So along that lines, I wanted to talk with you today about uh, what I've come up with is uh, some of the items that great facilitators uh, do and that can do, and that other facilitators who are learning how to do this work, these are areas that you might want to be focusing on in order to develop your own skills. Um, these are not the only skills. These are just the five or the six that, uh, you know, I kind of thought as I was reflecting this morning, these are skills that if I see these in facilitators, they're going to be doing a pretty darn competent job in their programs. And, uh, and so, you know, we'll just, let me just give you the list here. The first one that I think is really important for facilitators to be able to do is to engage clients, uh, participants quickly. All right, so participants come to our program oftentimes disgruntled, to say the least. Uh, they're not happy about spending the money. They're not happy about spending the time. They're not interested in developing a relationship with me or anybody else. They just want to get through the hoops and get through the requirement of attending the class. So as a facilitator, my job is to take a mistrusting initial connection and try to build a trusting connection relationship with these people because the faster I can do that, the sooner they're going to engage in learning, the sooner they're going to engage in considering other possibilities, the sooner they're going to be able to hear things that they aren't really excited about hearing, that maybe they are accountable, they are responsible, that they do have beliefs and attitudes that are contributing to their cruel behavior in their relationships. Without that relationship, without that trust being established, it's very hard for our participants to be able to consider things that are outside of their general perspective. And so that first level of engaging in relationships with people who don't want them is a key foundation for any facilitator that needs to be established. The second thing that I think is very important, it's talked about in many circles, is just understanding the victim's perspective. Now, there's a lot of different victim perspectives. You know, if you know, uh, victims of a survival-based motive are quite different than the victim experience for those who are entitlement-based and are certainly quite different from those who are sadistic-based. But being able to understand the, what the victim experience is, what the dynamics of dis domestic violence entail, and knowing that when people come to our programs, they are distorting reality most commonly in their own favor. And so paying attention to listening to the reality distortion of our participants with having an ear also focused on what is the, the victim experience from people with different motives. And that helps us to be able to guide the participants into a closer walk with reality in their own lives, which is really kind of the mission of change, helping people walk as close to the line of reality as they can. And understanding the dynamics of domestic violence and understanding that not all victims are the same and not all of those who batter are the same is really important in being able to be an effective facilitator. Now, the third piece that I think is really important is for the facilitator to have a radar for external versus internal focused dialogue. Change occurs with an internal focused conversation. Change does not occur as long as people are externally focused. And so our job is to help people become self-reflective, to be able to talk about themselves, 
to be able to look at the world from their own perspective as opposed to being externally focused, talking about their partner, the court service officer, the weather, the sports team, you know, general generalities. They want to be, we want to be able to help people talk from an internal focused perspective. And that's a bit of a trick for facilitators because facilitators kind of have to learn how to do that too. Learning how to talk and speak from an internal focused position is a bit of a skill for people to learn, including facilitators, including licensed clinical social workers like myself. And so learning what it looks like, what it sounds like, and then how to guide conversations from an external focus position to an internal focus is critical. And so we want to be able to develop that. And you can watch facilitators who have that skill, who can help the participants become reflective and introspective in ways that the participants didn't expect when they first started the conversation. So the fourth thing that I would like to be able to uh, to be able to talk about is kind of connected to that, you know, having our, our own ability to be internally focused, is that facilitators have to do the work that we're asking the participants to do, right? I would argue that it is cruel for us to push our participants into looking at things, examining things, and taking ownership for behaviors that we ourselves are not willing to look at, examine, or take ownership for. Right? It's, it's really expected that if I'm asking somebody to be accountable for abusive and cruel behaviors, that I would do the same thing and be accountable for my abusive and cruel behaviors. You know, we've all been cruel. We've all been intentionally inflicting pain and suffering, or we blatantly disregarded somebody in our relationships. That does not make us battering individuals. It means we made cruel decisions, right? We made abusive decisions, imposing our will on others. It may not be a pattern, but it's very easy for most people to identify times and, yep, I've, I've been cruel, I have been abusive, and I was selfish, I was disregarding my partner or others. We want to be able to take ownership of that. Facilitators who are really worth their salt are able to walk very close to reality with their imperfection. In fact, we can lead through our imperfection and help others to accept their own imperfections as well. That's a very key thing for facilitators to be able to do their own work, be comfortable in their own skin, and walk as close themselves to the line of reality as possible so that they can lead others through example instead of leading from behind. Another skill that I truly admire when I watch really experienced, skilled facilitators develop and what, they, what they're doing is that they create a community experience in their, in their own group. The group is supportive of each other. The group is all in it together. It's not eight or 12 individuals sitting in chairs, but it's a group of people. There's a lot of different ways to run a group. There's a lot of different functions of how groups can be beneficial. But the thing that they have in common is that feeling of community, that we're all in this together, whether it's a facilitator-led experience or whether it's a group-led experience. You know, however you decide you want that community to move forward, building a community. And when, you, when I sit in with other facilitators around the country, around the world, who are really skilled, you can feel that sense of community before long. You know, people are asking about how each other is doing. They're supporting each other in struggles. They're holding each other accountable. They're calling each other during the week, trying to support each other as well. There's really a community that's being built. And that is created by the facilitators and how they're approaching the boundaries that they're setting, the structure that they're establishing. And so I would encourage you to take a look at how is your group community forming? How is it doing at supporting each other to that everybody's in the world of moving toward a non-abusive, non-cruel relationship? Uh, and they're all supporting each other together. Uh, the last thing that I'd really like to talk with you about is this focus on accountability. You know, 
really strong, highly skilled facilitators are very good at holding their group participants accountable. But they're also really good at holding themselves accountable. You know, I watch our assistant director, Tish Taylor, when she shows up late for class, how she holds herself accountable you know, for the lack of integrity of getting to class on time and having people wait. She did not do what she said she was going to do. And I, I watch her take ownership and role modeling for her group about how to be accountable for promises that we make that we don't follow through with. Facilitators who are really highly skilled are reliable, they're not afraid of accountability, they're not afraid of ownership, and they lead by example, again, and they can help other people do those same things without damaging the relationship. It's really, really fun to watch somebody highly skilled lead by example by being accountable themselves, and then when they ask others to be accountable, then it's, it's not damaging to the relationship. Uh, the final thing I would tell you is that there's a real need to understand the change process. And the change process is a moving target. We are not as a profession, we are not as a field, we are not as a human race very knowledgeable about how to help people change, how to help people recover, how to help people heal. We, there is a constant, ever-changing field where there's new material coming out all the time. So great facilitators are pursuing information. They are pursuing new knowledge that might be applicable in their group room. And if you can do this and understand that you are a lifetime student and that the knowledge is going to continue to grow and we have to keep looking for it and keep getting better, then the victims the children, the families, and the participants in your group will be so appreciative because they'll be able to create lives that they had given up the dream of being able to create because they can't do it without somebody to guide them into how to have healthy, respectful, equality-based relationships where we can all be genuine, we can all be authentic, we can all be ourselves. So, you guys, I hope that was valuable. I hope that that gave you some things to think about. And I will look forward to seeing you again in July. Uh, it's hard to imagine the summer's already flying by. I was just, you know, I think a couple of weeks ago, excited about seeing a flower finally blooming. But here we are, summer's on its way. We'll see you soon, and thank you for all that you do.